today I'm going to talk to everybody about how to reclaim your innovator mind. And it may or may not surprise you that a big chunk of that is the same mind that you had when you were five. Um, but, you know, before we do that, one thing I noticed uh, walking around here today was I was really surprised because I realized that this room is full of holes. And so what I'd like to do is I just want to take 10 or 12 seconds and I'd like everyone to just find a hole and put it in the middle of your table. 10 or 12 seconds, really quickly. Okay. Is there any table that does not, is there any table that has failed to find a hole? No. But what's interesting about that exercise and why I love it so much is I've asked you to make a connection to something that you think you know and the second after I asked, I had a lot of stares. A lot of, what? <laughs> what? And, and what happens with that is first of all, people are confused. I know what a hole is and she's saying put a hole in the middle of the table, I don't get it. Secondly, I have people who are annoyed. Give us more instructions, you know? Tell us a little bit more, you know? And then there's people who say, all right, I don't know what she's asking for, but I'm just gonna wait till someone else figures this out. Because I'm not gonna take a risk of doing it wrong, right? Is we have all those reactions probably in the room. But what I really love about this exercise is when I say put a hole in the middle of the table, it's something you know, you know what a hole is, yet you, you're faced with this brick wall, you have nowhere to go until you figure it out. And then suddenly, this little window opens up to a whole world of possibilities. We could spend the whole 18 minutes finding holes, I guarantee you. Would it be easier for me? But we're not going to do that. Um, so I'm gonna just talk to you. That, what you just did, is really what an innovator mind does. So I'm going to talk to you about how to reclaim your innovator mind by making connections, but not just making connections, but making connections with joy. I'll tell you more about that. So I, yes, I'm an innovation consultant. I've been working for 30 years either in or with Fortune 500 companies, helping them to innovate. And when people think about innovation, they think about a bunch of people in a room ideating and creating. And that happens. That, this is kind of a helicopter view of the innovation process. And that does definitely happen in the innovation process. But the process is much longer and bigger than that. You have to do certain things. You have to do things like what Henry talked about. You have to collaborate and empathize with your users before you start having ideas, if you really want those ideas to work. You have to, you have to do research. You have to, it's, it's analytical. It's creative, but it's analytical. And it's a long, up and down process. And if you really want to do innovation, there's a lot of skills that you have to use that you don't usually use every day, and skills that we're not taught very much. And those skills are things like true collaboration, um, learning, you know, learning from failure. That's huge. We're, we're taught to avoid failure, not learn from failure. Um, and you also have to be an optimist. You know, if you're, if you're a cynic, and it's kind of fun to be a cynic, you can't innovate. So if you are a cynic, you just have to find your inner optimist when you're innovating. So there's a lot of those skills. But I would say, if I were to say what one skill comes into play in every single part of the innovation process, that would be making connections. Now, your brain does this automatically. It's not something you have to learn. But it's different to make connections. You've made hundreds of them in the time that you've been here, maybe even thousands. But to make connections with joy is something different. What I mean by making connections with joy means that when you make the connections, number one, you let them live. You don't kill them. Because that's what we're used to doing, and I'll explain in a minute why that is. But you make connections, you let them live, you embrace them, and then you use those connections to get to someplace new. And that's making connections with joy. Um, you know, we all start out as natural innovators. Uh, you may or may not know this. Um, while I was getting a business degree, 
for some reason, I also got a degree in early childhood education. Um, and <laughs> I'm not really sure why I did that, but it actually paid out. Um, and I'll tell you why. When you take a four or five year old and you give them a problem to solve, about 75% of the types of thinking skills that they use to solve that problem are the same skills I just talked about that you need for innovation. 75%, that's a lot. And by the way, when I do the bring me a whole exercise with kids, I get no blank stares. I almost do not finish saying, put a hole in the middle of the table. And they are up. They are getting holes from everywhere. And then they, someone always comes running up to me and says, the whole room is a hole, and the windows are a hole, and you have two holes in your nose, and then they have, you know, they are, and, and not only are they not afraid to be wrong, they're trying to best each other for thinking of the craziest thing, right? We don't want to be silly, and we don't want to be wrong. We like to be right. We like to feel smart. Kids like to feel unique. They like to feel like they thought of something no one else thought of. What do you think happens when those kids are 11 or 12 years old, this is now fifth or sixth grade, and they're given a problem to solve, what percent do you think they use? 15. 15. 25. 25. Well, actually, you guys are more pessimistic even than the reality, but it is still pretty pathetic, which is, it's 35%. It goes down to 35%. And that's because they're being taught some really important critical thinking skills. Let's say that's your right arm. And they're being taught that those are the more important skills to use. And they're just, they, what, what's happening to the left arm is they have some strength, but it's just from kind of leftover from what they had. I work with corporate executives. <laughs> <laughs> so, just add to fifth or sixth grade, middle school, high school, graduate school, some PhDs, and let's tag on about 20 years of working in the corporate world. So we statistically, I'm not sure what kind of number we can put here. I, I don't know how much minus we can go, but even they agree that it's way in the minuses. And what the irony of the whole thing is I got this crazy dual degree in business and early childhood education, and now I spend my time teaching executives to teach to think the way they thought when they were four or five years old. So now I know why I did that. Um, so what's the difference between critical thinking skills versus innovation thinking? I get asked this all the time. Um, there are books written on this. So um, it's not possible to do it, certainly not in the probably 10 minutes I have left. But um, the difference really, I've boiled down to one slide. And it has to do with making connections. So critical thinking and traditional problem solving, that is an exercise of elimination. What you're doing when you're doing traditional problem solving is you're basically killing connections, right? You're trying to get to something called the answer. And to get to the answer, you have to limit, eliminate all the connections that don't seem to make sense. And by the way, I'm not saying this is a bad thing. If you have an innovation and you want to get it out on the market and you want people to have it and you want it to have a nice long life, you need a lot of these skills. These are very, very important skills. That's why we teach them in schools. That's why we teach them everywhere. But when you want to innovate, you need a whole different set of skills. And that we don't teach very well. So what happens is you got this nice, big, strong right arm that does this very well. And you learn how to kill connections. And you learn how to do it faster. And you learn how to take, make it risk-free. And when you're in school, if you do this well, you get A's. In business, if you do this well, you get a raise and bonuses. So, and you know, there's another great thing. You feel smart. Don't we all like to feel smart? We like to feel smart. And that's, that's a way for you to feel smart. Flip over to innovation thinking and solution building versus problem solving. And what you have is a totally opposite way of thinking. You actually have to generate as many possibilities as you possibly can. You have to make connections that don't even seem to make sense. You actually have to embrace connections. You have to let connections live, right? You have to really, really make all kinds of crazy 
connections to do innovation thinking. But here's the interesting thing. So when we do this in the corporate world, we have two-day ideation sessions. And we have literally 800 <coughs> post-it notes of ideas. How many people here have been in some kind of brainstorming session where someone starts off and says, there are no bad ideas? Raise your hand. So you've been lied to. <laughs> but actually, there are a lot of bad ideas. In fact, out of the 800 post-it notes that we have on the wall, I would say maybe 90% of them are bad ideas. And the reason why they're bad ideas is because there's almost no invention, no innovation that comes up from one person's head, boom, like that on a post-it note. That's not how it works. What you do is the reason we have those 800 post-it notes is we make as many connections as we possibly can, not even to solve the problem, just connections to what we're trying to do. And then the magic happens where you, you go and you find the little nuggets <coughs> in all of those ideas. And because you make connections to random things, you actually take those little nuggets of newness from all those ideas and you combine it to make a new solution. It's the total opposite. So if we say that the, the right arm is critical thinking skills and the left arm is innovation thinking, we need, we need both. So I'm going to tell you how this worked, a situation of how this worked in real life. About 17 years ago, I had the opportunity to work with uh, a company that made cranberry juice. These are cranberries. Uh, what color are cranberries? Red. Primarily the red. But I think, if you notice, there's some actually all white berries in there. It used to be, these were the enemy, these white berries. They're not supposed to be there. They're berries that are mature but not ripe. And they were junk berries. And they had to be gotten out of there. So when the growers would get bring in their bushels of cranberries, they would get paid less if they had too much white cranberries. And so they were really the, the bane of everyone's existence because you have to sort out the white cranberries. We do an exercise with our, with our clients to try and get them, because it's very hard to get people to think differently about what they know. We try and get them to make connections they wouldn't normally make. And one of the ways we do that is we say, we want you to come up with the worst idea ever. <laughs> and they hate this exercise. And we, we say, all right, we're going to make a new juice. I want everybody to write down the worst idea they could think of. And one brave soul said, all right, my worst idea is, well, let's make the juice out of the white berries instead of the red berries. And everybody laughed, because it was really a bad idea. And in fact, he was a little worried about even offering this idea. And so we said, OK. So that went up as one of the 800 post-its. And when it came time to pull out the golden nuggets, this is how we do it. We say, OK, even though you think it's the worst idea, find two things about that that are good. And they struggled with this. Because remember, they're not used to it. They, they, they don't have much of a left arm action. So I said, what's two things? So one person came up with, you know what? It doesn't stain. And they get a lot of calls, by the way, of how do I get off cranberry stain. So oh, one doesn't stain. And then one of the scientists said, well, actually, that juice is less tart. Mm. And we combined that with another idea, which said we wanted a light summer drink. Now, anyone here ever drink white cranberry juice? Yes. It's not, not only is it on the market, but it outsells red cranberry juice now, 17 years later. So you guys want to practice? Want to do something? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you do a little exercise called touch something. And this just gets those parts of your brain that want to connect the way you were when you were five, it gets them going. It's like a little, a little calisthenic for your brain for that. So what I want you to do is I want you to just touch things 
And I want you to, every time you touch something, I want you to call it something else. If you touch a cup, I want you to call it an engine. If you touch your head, I want you to call it a foot. If you touch, whatever pops into your head. And the key to this, I'm going to tell you now, the key to this is to do it fast. Fast, fast, fast. Okay, I just want you to call it out. When you touch something, call it something else. Ready? Ten seconds, go. exercise and I wanted to game it. I wanted to do it really well. So what I did was I said, you know what? I'm just going to pick animals. I, I'm sure some of the group has done this. And you pick animals and it doesn't matter what you touch. You can touch everything and all you do is say dog, cat, bird, fish, you know. And guess what? I didn't make a mistake. I never touched a chair and called it a chair. And I did it fast. It was easy and it was low risk. And I was feeling very smart. And here's a hint. Anytime you're feeling really smart, you are not innovating. You're not even close to innovating. If you don't feel uncomfortable, you are not innovating. So I'm sorry to tell you that. But then a guy next to me said, well, you went through a lot of trouble because I touched everything and I called everything an elephant. And I thought, oh my God, he's even smarter than me. <laughs> and so I was feeling smart, he was feeling smarter, and then we learned that the whole, the whole exercise was to help you make connections. And we had basically bullied our way into that with our right arm, feeling so smart, and we got an F in making connections, and an F in making connections with joy, because we basically gamed the system and found a way to do it without making any connections at all. So, for those of you who touched something red and said fire engine, or touched something green and said frog, how many people touched something and made a connection when you said it, you go, I don't even know where that came from. Anybody raise your hand if you made like a, some weird connection. That's great, that's the best, that's actually what you really want to do. Because that's when your brain is going, oh my God, we haven't done this since we were five. And that is what you want to do. You want to allow your brain to make the connections exactly the way you make them when, when you were five. That is making connections with joy. So um, I want to end with a little story. So this story is about my son Noah. He's 17. And Noah has ADD. And when he was in elementary school especially, it caused a lot of problems. Now, on the plus side, I don't know, for anyone who knows things about ADD, a lot of people with ADD are really creative. And there are a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of inventors have ADD. And the reason they're so creative is guess what they do really, really well? Make they let in all those connections. And not only that, they love those connections. They keep them alive. They use them. Right? They make connections with joy. That was great. That was the great part. Noah was always coming up with new ways to use things, a lot of broken stuff in the experimentation, but we loved it. Let me tell you what's not so good. Homework. Executive functioning. If you look, write down every single step you had to do from the time you're sleeping in bed to the time you get to where you're supposed to be going in the morning, it's like 25 things. When you don't do executive functioning well, that's oppressive. It's even more impressive when you have to keep track of the time, which you really don't do well. And let me tell you what the most oppressive part of it is, is that you're making connections. Noah would make 100 connections from the bedroom to the kitchen. And he wanted to do stuff with all those connections. So we had a lot of missed buses. We had a lot of missing homework. Uh, the homework sessions were brutal at night for both of us. And after one particularly difficult session, homework session at night, 
We were sitting taking a much needed break. And Noah said, you know, Mom, I really feel bad about people who don't have ADD. <laughs> and I have to say, that was not my thought at the time. <laughs> I did not feel bad for those kids, and I didn't feel bad for the parents of the kids. Um, but I was really intrigued, because it was really rough, and he, you know, talk about optimism. And I said, well, why is that? And he said, he said, you know, Mom, when I look at, whoops, uh, I'm missing a slide uh, when I look at that table, there's a table with a lamp and some vase and stuff. He said, you know, most people would see five things. There were five things on the table. He said, when I look at that table, I see like a hundred things. He said, you know, there's a, there's a vase, and if you took the flower out, you could turn it on its side, and it was that, you know, that garage I wanted for my cars. And you were talking the other day about wanting a little frog cut in the garden. That's perfect, because it has this little lip. And on he went making connections with joy, until I felt sorry for everybody who didn't have APD. <laughs> I was with him, and I thought to myself, I have spent 20 years getting people to think exactly the way he's thinking, exactly the way he's thinking right now. And what really occurred to me is, now he's 17, <coughs> Guess what? With a lot of work, he figured out the executive functioning thing. He gets himself up and ready before we were even awake. Um, but he is going to be going to a top school in September in an unbelievable design program, groundbreaking design program, that he got into on the basis of this amazing creative portfolio. And he's one of the lucky ones because he learned the executive functioning and was able to retain his ability to make connections with joy. And you can learn how to make connections with joy. You too can be ambidextrous with your brain. And that's what I wish everybody here. <laughs>